I have Dalmazign and Gladness for the subscribers and um, nothing for the non-subscribers. Um, the Greek way of approaching Techni is not Heidegger's way, although Heidegger um, superimposes his thinking on the Greeks. Uh, this is the lecture is about uh, Heidegger's thinking of Techni and the technological essence. Uh, I give evidence of that um, on his the occasion of his 100th birthday, I believe, or while he was 100 years old, uh, an associate of uh, Heidegger's Gadamer, younger associate, um, mentions that uh, he wanted to do at least something better than Heidegger. That was uh, to improve his Greek beyond the level of Heidegger's Greek. He did that. He reported back to Heidegger that Heidegger had made um, some errors and um, Heidegger said, well, you mean there are errors in Heidegger, referring to himself um, uh, abstractly in that sense. And um, Gadamer reported that Heidegger did not um, fix these errors. The interviewer then went on to say, well, I forget the exact word, but he said something like, that's, that's sophistry. Heidegger is not um, going by um, philological science properly, um, but Gadamer uh, um, uh, came back and said, no, Heidegger really was superior in what he was doing. Um, he simply said Heidegger was superior. Um, but I add that I, I think that what Heidegger was doing, which is that he was violating the rules of um, making a forensic case by um, taking things out of the text and using them as exists to make a, a case for your reading. And said he was reading into the text, but in fact Heidegger was doing neither. If you think of Dasein as uh, no longer involved in this subject-object relation. So the text isn't something that we're merely uh, reading, is, is an object to us that we're merely reading, but uh, yet another version of um, Dasein must be thought here with regard to text, with regard to the Logos. Um, so nonetheless, I give a piece of forensic evidence, as it were, from um, the metaphysics, because there has to be something that gets us started thinking about these things, So, when, and, and that would be reading um, Heidegger, but then we go on to um, uh, the supreme pathway and the supreme vision, as the Greeks would have it, um, of techni, but in so doing, would we just be going into the Theoris' um, vision where we have, where we leave ourselves out, you see, this minimum leaving ourselves out, which is what Heidegger is. Um, once we start reading Heidegger, we have to superimpose a totally new um, understanding of what we're doing, not reading into the text, not reading out of text, um, perhaps um, a kind of um, trance-like mating of the two. Um, reminiscent of the um, uh, existence of the shore with the, um, the tidal um, change, the waves coming in and going out and the changing of the place of the shore and uh, the sea. Um, something like this, uh, I believe, um, is what Heidegger sees in, in, in Techni. And if you go to his metaphysics, um, sorry, if you go to his um, uh, investigation of Aristotle's metaphysics theta, where he's talking about um, energia or energia, meaning the actual, meaning what we can, what's right here before us, what the Greeks took as the ultimate thing, because um, again, they thought that the ultimate pathway was that of um, the highest form of practice, theory, the, which does not mean theory as opposed to practice, but it is a form of practice. The Theoria was originally somebody who went about um, uh, looking at um, the work of um, um, Pythias and um, oracles and uh, religious practices as in um, 
Thracian Bendis in the beginning of the um, Politeia or the uh, Plato's Commonwealth or Republic, um, seeing things as it were from the balcony, not from within the um, action on the stage, um, and thereby the wish to come to this ultimate vision which was not interested. In other words, um, uh, I mean, to give a, um, a, a crude, concrete example, the, um, when the tobacco industry uh, wanted to prove that um, tobacco does not cause um, cancer, they are interested parties. When a mother uh, doesn't want to admit in a court of law that her son is a monster, that she's an interested party. Uh, the philosophers were supposed to be not interested. They were dead to the world in the sense they were had the um, ultimate vision, that of a dead person. Uh, so Heidegger has to overcome all this, and we still live in this, this idea of the data, statistics, and so forth as being the real stuff, and on the other side, the anecdata, the mere um, feeling of how things are, um, mere emotion and so forth. Um, so with regard to techni, um, what Heidegger is saying is, by techni he does not mean technology, he does not mean uh, science, even in the current uh, dispensation of the, European, of the um, complete idea of European science as um, that which is measurable or that which is repeatedly testable, but uh, rather, um, I could say it poetically. So, um, no, for instance, right now there's some, um, I don't know if it, it's very visible in the uh, video, but there's some turkeys over here, some wild turkeys um, uh, browsing about in the dirt and uh, kicking up dirt and, and, and looking for grubs and so forth. Um, so you could say um, those are turkeys uh, and somebody might respond, well, that works for me. Okay, turkeys. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In this sense, working for me uh, is the ergon. So Heidegger, and uh, again, I point to the um, metaphysics theta investigation of Heidegger, which is a prolonged look at the ergon understood as fusus, understood as this um, trans-like mating of energia on the one side, actuality, and dunamis, possibility, possibility on the other side. So um, techni is really um, overlaid on, on the basic understanding of fusus, remembering that fusus um, we can translate that nature, fuses, um, physis, physics, um, physical. Um, the Greek and the Latin uh, language are very closely related. So you have fuses in Greek and uh, physis in um, Latin. I don't want to go too far afield, but I'll just point one thing out, um, which is that um, Giordano Bruno, um, at the foot of the Enlightenment, said that um, anything that we can say in um, Greek, we can also say in Latin, there's no problem. This is the attitude, I believe, which is essentially still with people like Zizek. Um, I almost want to say that this is the core of his atheism. <clears throat> it's very unclear what atheism really means most of the time, except that um, in the case of Dawkins, you can see that uh, some people don't agree with what he considers to be empirically the case, and then he gets very angry about that. With Zizek, it's more subtle. But um, it seems to be really this idea that anything you can say in Greek, you can say in Latin, uh, really means that um, there's not uh, what um, uh, Heidegger or Franz Boas or Dugan or myself would say that there are um, different Dasseins. And um, I believe in addition, what that means is that um, it's not what Heidegger really means by removing consciousness, which um, Hubert Dreyfus, Dreyfus had so much 
problem with. He kept trying to describe things as though we weren't conscious. It's rather that we still describe ourselves as conscious, but we understand what conscious means in a different way. That's what Dreyfus missed. We superimpose a new um, ergon on it. So um, just as we could superimpose the idea um, that somebody who's very tired is actually very old, and we could actually see it that way, the same way we superimpose a new ergon on to the idea that um, 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 we don't try to explain, we don't try to describe it so that we leave out consciousness, but we understand consciousness differently. Um, John Searle criticized, I think I mentioned this there, the um, video that John Searle criticized um, Hubert Dreyfus for making a description which made it sound like the human being was a um, so-called philosophic zombie. And the reason why Dreyfus was driven to do that is because he didn't see that Heidegger's understanding techni in a way that it means how it works for Dasein, which isn't how it works for a subject. So um, you could even say that of a leaf. Does the, this is a leaf. Oh yeah, that's a leaf. Saying it's a leaf means the same thing as, yeah, that works for me. I understand you, that's a leaf. Um, we know what a leaf is. So I give an example. Um, uh, oh, I forget the name. There's a great waterfall right at the border of Brazil, um, a complex of waterfalls. And if you look it up on um, oh, Argazuga Falls, that's not right, but something like that. But if you look it up on Google, um, these great, uh, I think they're somewhat larger than Niagara Falls in South America, the border of Brazil. Um, if you look it up on Google, you get you find out there's a five-star rating for that. So it's like, what does that mean that there's a five-star rating for a waterfall? Um, this, I link to evidence in what Heidegger's saying in his essay on technology. What he says is, instead of rivers, we're understanding tourist destinations. They become part of the tourist industry. So why does Google give certain spots a five-star rating? This is great waterfalls, a five-star rating, because they've become tourist destinations and moreover on a deeper level they become uh, destinations for our our pleasure like we want to know how much pleasure we're going to get out of this thing uh you can look up a um say say if you look up a park that's in your neighborhood somewhere somewhere close to you you probably won't get the five star rating right because it's not as um magnificent a, a thing as uh it's not it doesn't have the solar radiation um, of Apollo, you're not falling, walking across the ray of light given by Apollo when you, uh, given by rationality itself, when you go to your local park, it's probably only a four star rating, maybe four and a half. But you get five stars for this the great water, these, um, let's say, memorably awesome waterfalls down here in South America. Um, but let's see what that really, but this is meant as a transformation of the ergon and therefore has what techni means for Heidegger, as what the technological essence means for Heidegger. See, everything is a standing reserve for us, for our pleasure. But now let's see what that means. That all sounds fine so far, but let's see what that means in another example, which um, is profoundly troubling for many people. Um, in a recent article in, um, there's actually tens of thousands of these peer-reviewed um, academic journals, I should point out for people who don't know that. Um, but in one of them, on bioethics, um, some of the writers, uh, Americans who took for granted um, that uh, there's no ethical problem with abortion. Um, okay, a lot of us have grown up in areas where abortion is taken for granted, and I think even um, in the Catholic tradition, up until the time of the quickening or the first movement of the, um, we've got a dog chasing the, um, uh, the wild turkeys off. Um, up until recently, um, 
the Catholics drew back and they said, um, okay, we have to um, go against abortion totally. They used to allow abortion up until the moment when the fetus um, started to move, which they called a quickening. This was still true. Um, if you read the writings of James Wilson, one of the early um, American Supreme Court justices and one of the founders, um, you still see that. Um, so, um, but if you go further, what this article was saying was that even after birth, um, there's no, according to them, there's no rational difference between uh, what's usually called infanticide, meaning uh, killing an already born uh, infant, and abortion. But they said uh, the whole article was premised on the fact that it's irrational to make draw a distinction there. And they argued that uh, this ought to be called um, post-birth abortion because the word was um, had some bias attached to it. But okay, what's the point? The point is that um, the idea behind this is that the infant, uh, what they were really thinking of is cases of, say, an infant where you only found out that the infant had Down syndrome uh, after it was born. And then you have theorists like Peter Singer is probably the arch uh, theorist here. And what he's saying is um, it's something like with going to these waterfalls. You want a five-star rating on your kid. So it's like, why should you give birth to a kid that has um, uh, Down syndrome? That's their point. So what he argues is, and if you read Peter Singer, you can see a long argument about this, like um, the kid won't be able to, um, he actually gives the um, funny example of he won't be able to talk to you about a, um, um, a movie at the, um, the film archive with you or um, such a child won't be able to, um, uh, he actually gives the example of a Woody Allen movie, but this was some years ago. But um, he won't be able to do a number of things, learn um, musical instrument, et cetera, et cetera. So then the impression is that um, the infant, who should now be understood not as um, murdered, infanticide, but has uh, post-birth um, abortion, which is meant, <clears throat> according to their, they take for granted, as I've mentioned, that abortion is... Uh, not morally um, objectionable, um, so they just want to extend what they already have, is like the parents should be able to um, bring uh, something into the world that they will enjoy, just like they enjoy visiting this five-star um, waterfall. So I think this is what Heidegger is getting at with the ergon and with the technological essences, which things keep changing their essence, and this could be driven, and I believe this also will change the look of things, which is um, that may not make um, obvious sense, but I think if you think through the example of um, even if we were saying um, people will appear as if they're aging, couldn't we have um, imagine an existence where People looked like they were aging and then they did what we call falling asleep, but they actually appeared visually like they're aging. Sometimes that actually happens. Sometimes one experiences that, but that that would be just the norm. And then when people died, that would we could call that uh, going to sleep. They would appear to be going to sleep. Um, something like that is already thought anyway, but I'm saying that it would actually even appear that way to the eyes. And I don't believe that would be... Um, violated in any way by um, quantifiable um, science, which so much um, emphasis has been put on. I think you could still quantify it, but um, visually see it and understand it different, totally differently. Um, so in the same way, the ergon, which has, uh, which is techni, really. Techni is the, is the knowing. Heidegger says in that um, introduction to metaphysics, techni is knowing. And knowing here means um, um, 
the same thing that it meant in the first instance of uh, Fuses in the Odyssey, which uh, that instance is of an uncertain date because we know when the Odyssey was written down, I think in the fourth century BC or sometimes before, no, maybe a little, maybe a hundred years before Socrates was around or so, but it, when it was written down doesn't tell us about the um, troubadour or rhapsode um, um, history of the reciting and the singing of it for um, 700 or 1,000 years before that when it actually came into uh, the poem, which is of many, many thousands of lines. And sometimes a few of those lines change, which is known through uh, studies in Albania, which are made of a, a very long lasting um, rhapsodic tradition. Um, but in any case, um, this is quite ancient. Um, Fusus uh, in Odyssey already meant energia and dunamis, the look of the thing and what the thing was to become. And between that, the ability somehow to alter it of uh, logos, I believe. So we should go further into how logos somehow intervenes, how speech, how language, how that which um, is special to Dasein somehow intervenes in that, in the, the in-between of these um, uh, forces which are vying uh, against themselves within the cells as they gather uh, to themselves and uh, come to presence but also withdraw.